India. I do that every day, and I can see, you know, you know, cities that are of interest to me. Delhi is of interest. Bangalore, Vadodara is of interest, which is my hometown. Pune is of interest, and so on. And uh, so I've got friends there. I've got my sister there. So it's of interest to me. So we are using colors, and we are using various analytical techniques to say this is what is happening. The next step we can do. and for which we need a larger amount of data because you know if we are going to do neural networks and deep learning which is iterative and incremental learning to do what to make predictions to set the trends to identify the trends so again we can go uh, coarse granular or we can go fine granular we can use macro data we can use fundamental data to decide through our algorithms what is going to happen so descriptive is what is happening Pre predictive is what will happen and then prescriptive which we are hardly using right now because in particular with the virus we haven't had enough time and we haven't had enough opportunity to make use of the data to say what should be done so what should be done prescribe is actually happening through natural intelligence right now rather than artificial intelligence there is a overlap uh, ai is utilizing ai but ai is not prescribing what should be done it is us humans who have who are taking decisions and of course there is anticipated uh, confusion and chaos but uh, in fact i wrote another article to argue that ai is not going to get rid of confusion and chaos because ai is not value based whereas ni natural intelligence is value based but that's a different topic so those are the three things that we need to remember and when we do our research projects even when we are doing small educational teaching projects we start with descriptive and go up to predictive and right now prescriptive is Uh, you know a dedicated separate industry sponsored project then it is uh, much better or the tools uh, but otherwise descriptive and predictive is good enough to get a handle on 90% of what we are doing in ai ml space a little bit of technology i mentioned earlier that because of the cloud because of amazon ibm google and uh, microsoft we are able to store vast amount of data ability to store free and dirt cheap data is one reason why we have got big data but this is a technical slide so for those uh, students in particular who are dealing with hadoop uh, who are dealing with um, big data from a technical angle they know about it that we really have the the key reason why we have big data is because of distributed data storages and you can see i have just tried to show on on uh, node 1 we have got data uh, databases if you like or data tables 1 through 4 but on node 2 we have repeated it and then node 3 we have certain other data um, tables that are repeated and node 4 this is the work of uh, dave cuttings and all the earlier gurus in um, uh, yahoo space and uh, those who uh, and dave cuttings is the one who produced hadoop which is literally it's so much of redundancy is included in it that uh, you know you search for um, method science and i search for method science and we are going to get results instantaneously but the actual data from which you and i are getting results could be sitting on two different clusters two different nodes in two different physical locations and to me that is extremely interesting technically the the cap theorem is applied and uh, and and so on again a different topic to what i'm presenting but i thought those of you who are interested in the technical parts uh, would like would appreciate the fact that we are having big data and we are having machine learning on big data because we have at the heart of it hadoop as a it not only a technology but also a philosophy so if there are 
uh, vendors who are providing cheap cloud services uh, who don't know much about Hadoop. They are still actually uh, basing it on the philosophy of, uh, of Hadoop. Now, I had told you I'm going to show you a little bit on how Amazon is using um, this big data that they are collecting. The reason why they are providing free storage is also to be able to analyze it and they are doing it legally because macro data is allowed under certain policies and uh, governance structures to be used. So here is a very, very simple example. It's called long tail marketing and it is possible only because of this AI ML operating on big data. So I have got, you know, X1 through whatever X10, 12, I've got uh, X10, I've got customers and I'm storing their data. And from A to K, I've got product. So I'm storing that data on Amazon and we have all gone on Amazon. In fact, I went very recently to send something to my, my sister. I could do that on Amazon.in. When I have to buy something here, I have to, I'd go to Amazon.com. Now, X4 is, um, sorry, let me go through, yeah. So now X3, let's say, is, is me, is Bhuvan Unelkar stored on Amazon.com. And uh, X9 is my wonderful friend, very, very dear friend, Dr. Anurag Agarwal. He's also a full professor here, uh, working in a different university. And he and I share many common interests. Uh, not just technology, but also other interests. And uh, let's say um, he happens to buy a book on meditation by Osho, just as an example, which is yeah. not a book uh, that everybody is going to uh, buy, but he buys yeah. the book. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you try once by minimizing the screen means instead of uh, showing the screen means in the PPT show mode, uh -huh. just try to is this what you mean? Yeah, is this any better? This one? Yeah. This one is better. This one is better. Oh, okay. So we can do this. Now we can at least see the complete slide. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Um, okay. So, so X3, which is me, and X9, which is Dr. Agarwal, Anurag Agarwal, we have a same... Uh, postcode, zip code, and he purchases a book over here, which is a very, you know, it's not commonly purchased, not the mainstream uh, book, but I suddenly get a suggestion from Amazon, which we have all experienced. Customer who bought this also bought that. So on what basis is Amazon making that recommendation? And it turns out to be quite quite relevant. So that is based on the correlations that Amazon establishes between two otherwise unrelated uh, data points. So Amazon has correlated my previous purchases and Dr. Agarwal's previous purchases and suddenly find that there is a synchronicity between the two and is able to make this suggestion because he purchased a book on meditation uh, that Amazon thinks will be of interest to me and it is of interest to me. So that's how <clears throat> we, the companies, I get asked question by non-technical people in particular that why is Gmail free and why is Amazon offering photos for free storage? Well, now we know that it is the macro and the alternative data that we generate by storing things on their servers that they are utilizing legally in order to make these kind of uh, business decisions, business insights. Okay, so one important question that is um, getting asked is, if we have the big data on its own, will that not serve the purpose? Well, uh, I have already listed that um, it is IoT devices, it is us, you and I, uh, our day-to-day -day activities that are generating a phenomenal amount of data and, and, and with high speed. 
we humans cannot make sense of it we can store it but for me a photograph that i have taken say 3 years back i have to search through the photographs with some keywords that i have already entered in order to locate those photographs so we in business in particular need machine learning in order to make sense of big data the data is so vast that we don't even know what to ask the data has some hidden potential some hidden stories some hidden gems that i can extract but i don't know what they are so in terms of the pandemic also there is so much of data that has been uh, collected now and uh, we are we humans are asking the data some questions that we think we can ask but maybe the data has some hidden Uh, material that we don't even know so what what are we driving at well machine learning algorithms as perhaps some of you already know can be made to come up with uh, themes or uh, topics that are thrown by the data itself so if we are analyzing 10000 blogs and we are analyzing uh, data you know a few uh, one petabyte which is huge 1000 terabytes if we have to analyze that data we can code in such a way because everything comes down to that that the data itself is starting to provide some patterns that we had not asked for and that's what that's where we need machine learning we need to be able to process that in a given time and again it's important for handling the virus and the pandemic they there have been there are so many decisions that we have to take that have to happen within a certain time frame we cannot do it humanly we need machine learning and then of course handling the unstructured data variety we don't know how much of this data is quality data maybe there is a lot of dark data in it maybe there is a lot of noise introduced purposefully or un, uh, unknowingly and we need machine learning we need artificial intelligence to be able to handle that i have not mentioned robotics right now robotics in itself is a vast topic uh, and i know some of you will be interested in it but uh, from a supply chain optimization and i'm using the word optimization we need robotics to be in to be involved to be included in handling the optimization a uh, lot more than automation here is an example it's a very sensitive example from american viewpoint uh, all of us know that you know 911 although in our memory we also have our november uh, disaster in mumbai november december but in september uh, 11th of september when the twin towers came down decades ago this particular person dr james ricards did a fair bit of literally what we call big data analytics using machine learning and he established a correlation between the puts and some of you might know in financial markets uh, we have calls and puts uh, currency exchange you know right to buy a share at a certain price is called a call and a right to sell a certain share at a price is called a put and uh, there were two airlines involved in that disaster american airlines and united airways united airlines and the puts that is the right to sell a share at a certain price were high abnormally abnormally high and large amounts of puts were purchased 3 and 2 days before the disaster or 3 to 1 day before the disaster and so somehow that is called the prophecy project which is the first chapter in this particular book uh, death of money and um, he established this correlation between stock market and a terrorist event and uh, this is what i mean by analytics on alternative data because this data is not owned by um, uh, a particular agency but he could establish this correlation and not only that 
but he was asked he was asked by the cia to carry on his work and he was able to uh, predict the london uh, tube bombings and uh, i need to get that particular reference because that's not i don't think that's appearing in this particular book but uh, he was able able to alert authorities that something is going to happen in london a few hours before the london tube bombings happened he could not say exactly what's going to happen but he was monitoring stock market so that tells us whether we have opportunity to monitor data which appears to be seemingly unrelated data you know things like um, we are now saying every 100 years there is a pandemic there was one in 1920 called the spanish flu which killed lakhs of people in india uh, of course at that time we were not independent so we couldn't probably take decision but now we we are taking decisions is there is some data on what happened in 1820 and then there is some on 1720 uh, sometimes we have to go to bizarre situations like uh, bizarre in courts by the way to situations like uh, you know the star system the full moon and the half moon and whatever it is is that having a, a impact because here in sarasota we have already established that when it is a full moon night unam ka chand there are more accidents on the road and more shootings and more uh, you know things emergency uh, emergency services are more prepared on a full moon night and we used to call it hocus pocus once upon a time but you know big data is creating some correlations that are very interesting i used to teach uh, at uh, great lakes institute of management in uh, near mahabalipuram so near chennai um i had gone there a few times it was very enjoyable just two weeks uh, intense uh, education and i had told my students over there management students mba students that they have to come up with crazy looking correlations or ideas and uh, <coughs> one of them did a work on uh, palmistry so analyzing the hand prints again you know in india we used to do it maybe a thousand years ago now we don't but with big data somehow regularities in uh, the hand prints and the performance of a person or a particular event happening could be established there was one more project done on uh, how many times uh, uh, you know the the project was how to price a ipl player and i told my student if you can uh, do this successfully you are going to be Uh, you know multi multi millionaire because what's the right price for say virat kohli or uh, you know any of the any of the uh, cricketers when they are they make a bid in uh, in uh, ipl and uh, there are so many parameters so many factors so many bizarre factors and one student group came up with uh, you know how many times anushka is uh, smiling in the stands versus the potential performance of virat kohli on the ground and i said okay that's good it may not look very impressive right now but you are trying to establish a very wide seemingly unrelated data sets into a correlation which is exactly what james ricard had done uh, you know 20 years almost uh, back so if we have to make use of big data and machine learning we need to go and think in the third dimension or fourth dimension so what are the opportunities and challenges we are getting so now i am uh, so uh, i will try and shorten this and i want to leave some time for question and answers um, so this is my strategic cube and uh, this is something so that has it has got a business agility angle and a technology angle so you know our alternative data which is our social and mobile our granularity decision Uh, fine and coarse granularity local cloud storage and then tools and technologies to analyze it and on the business agility side and so we we need to anticipate as much as we can respond we need to collaborate um, not only uh, business collaborations to offer services but also technical level because all the data of all the companies seem to be sitting on the cloud so within legally acceptable parameters we have opportunity to collaborate and we have to generate value um, 
so i have some more details on it but this depends of course on uh, uh, you know your research interest and so on the more um, uh, research you are interested in doing the more i can share with you on you know opportunities you know we can grow the business we can come up with new marketing strategies even new products which new product is going to sell i mean airlines now they need information they need analytics to say at what point they can at least fly without making loss because now we are going to have you know interesting situations if one person is sitting in a row of 3 airlines cannot continue to fly so i was having chat with another uh, young student who is into robotics and he is saying we are going to redesign the planes so there is every chance that in the planes of the future you know when they say that um, when the air pressure is low uh, the masks will fall down well instead of masks coming down in emergency maybe we are going to have a, a mask that is going to come down as soon as we sit in the plane and that will you know uh, isolate the passengers and still enable the planes to fly so we have to be creative and analytics can provide those kind of opportunities here i have used optimization specifically in terms of supply chain and inventory management internal processes and a lot of opportunity exist including applying robotics in order to optimize internal processes this is another big area of research and i have got so many whatsapp uh, forwards you know people are saying now from patiala we can see the himalayas which we never saw i remember how new delhi and i'm sure all of you were involved in that a few years back we were trying out you know odd number cars on one some days of the week and even number cars on other days of the week to reduce pollution and suddenly with the lockdown the pollution has come down same has happened in bangalore same has happened in so many other places around the world so what kind of a correlation exists there are there are three major seemingly unrelated data sets one of which is coronavirus another is carbon emission and third is stock market and can there be a project that relates the three because no matter how hard we have tried we have not managed to bring carbon emissions under control until this pandemic happened so are there lessons to be learned are are we this particular presentation i am doing and i can see there are 200 plus uh, people uh, attending it thanks to all of you 207 exactly we could not have done this we did not even if we had the technology we did not have the mindset to do this but uh, now that we are doing it it has resulted in a certain amount of carbon saving i didn't have to fly in many are sitting in their homes right now and watching it so there is a big area of research opening up in terms of uh, the pandemic and the environment and in fact uh, another dear friend of mine professor yi chen lan who is a provost uh, pro vice chancellor in western sydney university where i used to work also for a few years in in australia he and i are putting together a application for a fulbright scholarship for him to work on exactly this environmental intelligence and environmental uh, environmentally responsible business strategies uh, one of my past phd students uh, dr bharti trivedi she has uh, she has in fact her phd on this topic but it was a while ago a few years back so that's the third area and the fourth is managing risk and ensuring compliance today in america if you talk to small businesses before the corona virus the biggest challenge they had was compliance they need to be in they need to be able to show that they are running their business according to the rules and regulations which requires them to fill out so many forms and submit so many um um you know requirements from the government analytics big data the technologies are making it possible to reduce the risks and to ensure bigger and better more appropriate uh, compliance through 
automation through optimization so those are some of the things uh, these are the four areas where business opportunities and research opportunities exist so now i'm going to speak for another 5 minutes or so that will be one hour of talk time and after that we'll open up for uh, for q and a and uh, i do want to highlight this and in fact i have highlighted this in my earlier physical visit in in january to india also and this is a website that i am quite fascinated with i'm sure there are many other websites but this is a very good uh, initiative and my interest within that is education and environment and i'm not talking just in terms of delivery but in terms of research in terms of coming up with good research projects and good ideas that can uh, that can help india by utilizing uh, the digital uh, technologies and digital data so it's a wonderful program i am a big fan of it and uh, i keep uh, visiting it and i encourage all of you to look at it and of course my interest as i said is education and environment and uh, i had actually edited a issue of uh, big data for cutter and uh, vince kellen had written this article on big data and higher education and there is a lot of very good uh, material within that particular issue and again i can try and get permission to to share it uh, at a broader level but i can certainly share my work uh, with any one of you who are interested but teaching research evaluating the students administration of education and compliance these are the five areas in which uh, big data machine learning can help the education sector and uh, right now the one uh, part that makes news of course is you know how, how we are able to take education to our villages with corona virus how education has been taken to even schools in delhi and other big cities in india uh, that has been the focus but there are other important aspects of the education sector like research and admin and so on that can a tremendously benefit with big data machine learning so this was of course my presentation on the education aspect nothing new here uh, you are all familiar with it this is my self promotion forgive me but platify is my company in fact uh, 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 tv rao my fellow co founder and a much brilliant mind and young mind in bangalore we came up with platify as you know platform on wifi we are saying that if we have a platform specifically for education then one of the big challenges in uh, education is the ability to provide a real life experience basically the ability to provide laboratories labs is crucial and in this particular case we have focused on a platform that can enable provisioning of lab near real lab like experience on the platform which is utilizing cloud and then this is of course again uh, of immense research interest as well a student sitting in uh, in uh, chennai wants to learn hindi and a teacher sitting in noida is able to provide that but the two are not connected Uh, a young man sitting in amdavad wants to learn some concepts of arithmetic or mathematics and a teacher sitting in bangalore can provide it but the two are not connected and look at the business models uh, uber or uber as we occasionally call it or uh, um, uh, airbnb these are the largest taxi companies and the largest hotel companies in the world that don't own a single taxi or a single hotel room so they have provided a platform to bring people together to bring capabilities together and we in platify are trying to bring the same capabilities on in the education sector and uh, we have also put together this chatbot and again uh, ankur had mentioned at the introduction about the importance of chatbots um, we got 10 lakh questions now that can be answered um at four tiers or four levels of support it, it's only at level 3 level 4 that a actual person gets uh, gets involved 
and this is another company that i am a part of this is formed by uh, my young friends here in america uh, josh baker uh, james winland winland and a couple of more and uh, this is dealing with uh, encouraging a user to document to count the points for you know buying a cup of coffee in a reusable cup that's the fundamental of course it goes to other areas also so that's eco plus those are all the applications that i'm talking about and now very finally uh, this may not be very relevant right now but uh, it's a framework again that i have put in this book and it's a research based framework to help medium to large scale organizations to adopt big data and machine learning and so the goal is to make businesses agile and there is again a definition of business agility which is the ability of the business to rapidly respond to external and internal changes and uh, that particular ability is what i am really calling a value because businesses need to be able to provide value through the use of big data machine learning and the value will come if they can respond fast and not only businesses even government sector needs to be agile in order to to respond fast so here is a framework this is at a high level um, this is at a very low level so each word in this this took me more than a year to produce i apologize if you can't read it i can't read it also just now but i have blown it up on a big a1 poster size and then it is readable and then of course i have got a student a group of student developing a app corresponding to this it's not ready right now but this is my flagship big data framework for agile business bd fab so i have covered most of the things i had planned to cover uh, i'm just about to reach one hour which was what i had agreed with dr ankur in terms of presentation what are the areas in which we can go further in fact the business optimization uh, slides that i shared with you earlier are setting the details of where we can go but uh, here are some more in terms of uh, uh, where we can go in terms of you know improving prescriptive analytics improving security and quality of analytics and then of course dealing with uh, you know cyber security cyber defense in indian context agriculture is a vast area um, you know where uh, big data analytics and uh, machine learning can provide a lot of value uh, governance risk compliance and then my personal interest education and environment so this is the summary of uh, what i had to present and of course i want to thank you all and ankur sir for inviting me and all the dignitaries who uh, have welcomed me here and all of you 200 plus people who have listened to me so thank you dhanyawad namaste thank you very much sir for such inspirational and kind words and uh, are we open now for uh, question answer session sir i am i am okay i am going to stop uh, sharing the screen and i am going to hand over the controls to ankur sir and then he can decide what he wants to do i am available <laughs> and i Are finished you? exactly in 1 hour and 30 seconds so always remember i am a indian and i can manage time that is <laughs> <laughs> so what, what i will do, do sir uh, uh, we do develop the like yeah in fact uh, people will post their questions in the chat box and i will read them for you sir yes very uh, that's a good idea yes sir please go ahead yeah so the first question that we have is if we use unsupervised learning to make prediction based on input data is it possible to take this data as historical data to train our newly developed machine under supervised learning okay so to understand the question correctly if we are using unsupervised learning yeah. can we use descriptive data is the question as i understand yeah. is it and, possible uh, to take this data as historical data to train our newly developed machine under supervised yes so i had mentioned two keywords iterative and incremental when i was describing those circles and i had mentioned about uh, deep learning now 
when it comes to unsupervised learning the 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 problem is how much are we ready to iterate because unsupervised learning is actually um postponing the supervision it is there is no magic and there is no you know drama happening in a in a database it will do what we want it to do so it is not that with unsupervised learning something magical is going to happen you and i have to do it and the best way to do it is to iterate in terms of supervised learning your training to your testing data proportion and so on can be set much earlier and your iterations can be much bigger or 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 wider in terms of unsupervised data your training testing data uh, splitting the data percentage itself will happen on increasing set of data you are doing unsupervised learning when you are trying to analyze a blog 10000 blogs without knowing what is there in it so you will have to go through the processes with a smaller set of data and picking up what that data is trying to show and then applying that to a, a, a bigger set of data unsupervised learning in one way is not entirely unsupervised so to answer specifically your question you can ap apply it to descriptive data you can apply it to structured data but your iterations should be much smaller than in terms of the size of the data and in terms of the time you have than supervised uh, learning thank you so much sir thank you for answering me such a great that and we have another question uh, that is from parul jhira does dark data means unorganized and unstructured data yeah it's a good question Uh, it appears like that but it can be even structured data so the way we need to understand the word dark data is not something good or bad or ugly something that we don't even know exists something that we cannot make use of and something that we have produced and stored unnecessarily is dark data and so let's go back to my photograph example you know we take a cell phone and we try to click and i i mean here is here is my uh, cell phone and you know i can i can i click lots of photographs i hardly ever take one i take three or four or five photos and one of them comes out to be good and i share that with my friends and i put it on facebook and so on what is happening with the remaining three or four photographs apply this question to a large bank to a government agency that is dealing with the with the virus apply this analogy though not exact to you know what uh, what uh, airlines are doing or what us as university are doing i mean i have got student assignments another simple example that i have stored years after years after years now i cannot make any use of it and i know that some of these projects were excellent like the ones that i was mentioning to you but i don't even know how to search for them now of course the best ones i have kept in a separate directory so dark data is any data that i cannot make use of or that i don't even know exist and therefore i cannot get rid of it if you have 2 terabytes of data on which your analytics are working and your business is making decisions and out of those 2 terabytes if let's say half 1 terabyte is unknown data or data that you don't know whether you should get rid of or not what will you do you will keep a backup of entire 2 terabytes every time you backup you are backing 2 terabytes so 1 terabyte is even the backup is a waste and it is creating you know more over over um, overheads for you and you are not able to make use of it it could be 
a large amount of structured data that you have backed up and then you have forgotten about it. It could be unstructured blogs and uh, discussions that have no relevance, but you are still analyzing it. Or it could be, um, you know, graphics and videos that uh, you have lost track of. That's dark data. Thank you so much. We have another question in the line. Difference between expert system and artificial intelligence is simply with respect to domain specific knowledge. This is what the participant knows. The question is, is there any other difference? Yeah, we can. And Professor Tad, who was here stuck in the pandemic uh, lockdown, and he and I used to have phenomenal discussions. He is an expert in expert systems, and he does not think that AI and expert systems is the same thing. And uh, the philosophical difference, according to him, is expert systems are also uh, are uh, mostly on the known side. So we actually created a matrix. Um, uh, we created uh, you know four quadrants, and then on top we said uh, um, systems. And on the left hand side, we said human. And then we said known, unknown for systems, and known, unknown for humans. And so now we have four quadrants uh, analytics and data that is known to the system and known to humans. That is where automation is happening. That is where, in my understanding, expert systems are happening. Because both. Uh, the data and the humans are aware of what is needed. You know, you can have an expert system for uh, medicine, you can have expert system for law, you can have expert systems for uh, flying, for airlines and so on, where the problem you are trying to solve is definable, even though you may not have fully defined. But then there are other three quadrants. And uh, the second one where the system knows the data, that is, the algorithms have the ability to process the data, but the humans are not aware of it. And this is where prediction happens. So that's the second quadrant and all the predictive analytics. And expert systems may be moving into it, may be able to do a certain amount, maybe a small amount of overlap. But according to my colleague, uh, Professor Tad, that's actually we are moving into a, a genuine AI space rather than simply limiting it to a expert system. The third quadrant is interesting where humans know that something is happening or humans have the ability to make certain decisions, natural intelligence, but there is no data for it. And uh, some of the decisions that were taken in India during the pandemic, which by the way, uh, I can be very proud of, I can tell you, because they were mimicked here. In fact, in my society where I am staying and in my university, everybody followed, you know, making noise and, you know, banging on, on steel plates uh, in early March. So that is experience where system doesn't know and human know. And then the fourth quadrant, which is what I have called intuition, where the system doesn't know and humans don't know. And that's what coronavirus actually is the best example where we have to take many decisions that are intuitive when it happened. So expert systems, in my humble understanding, are in the first quadrant of this known unknown matrix, where the data is known and we know how, how to make use of that data. Amazing, sir, amazing. This is what you researchers have known for. But we have another question. Mm -hmm. so lots of AI smart city projects that our government and private industry is working on. My question is, uh, this participant's question is, can AI having ability to analyze the accuracy in every data set related to a smart city project to control corruption and abilities? How much Absolutely. correlation of different segments we need? Yes. Sorry, sir, the last, uh, what is the last part of the how, question, sir? Yeah. How much correlation of different segments we need? Uh -huh. So I've got another young student in London right now. Uh, he is not yet a research student. He wants to get into research, but he and I, we wrote a, a, a book chapter right now and we are working on another paper and it's in the environment space. And he has started his work in the smart city uh, with the smart city concept. And uh, one of the things that 
you will have to do the researcher the student the faculty who is asking will have to do is actually uh, go into iot devices go into sensors sensors are um, you know dramatically changing the way we are collecting data and and of course then the way we analyze data so in some of the smart city uh, projects that we have had in india i believe sensors were placed on the back of public vehicles you know buses and uh, uh, trains or any any vehicle that is owned by the government uh, there is a right to place a sensor on it to start collecting data related to the environment and smart cities are extremely closely related with the environment uh, the smart way to live of course you know we have got age old uh, knowledge in india that uh, relates to smart living <laughs> which is coming up in the corona virus every 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 day and i get asked uh, questions here on you know the importance of turmeric and uh, you know sitting and doing a lom vilom pranayam you know people are trying to get into balance and to me a smart city is a balanced city so again a completely unrelated information but uh, i i'm a part of rotary for last 20 years almost and uh, you know behind me you can see there is a, this is my home by the way in florida and behind me you can see this small prayer area uh, daily puja and uh, i used to have a swastik there <laughs> and uh, people when they came to my home the earlier home also they were horrified to see <laughs> that i have a swastik here and i had, and they say oh you are you are you are a, such a gentle person and you are a vegetarian and you are having a swastik i said this is a 5000 year old symbol uh, of india it has nothing to do with the nazi swastik and then i actually gave a series of talks and one of the key things that i mentioned in the talk in all my talks completely non technical and again happy to share with those who are interested is that the swastik is a representation of balance one simple word i said that swastik represents is balance and then of course we went through all uh, other theories around balance but i mean gartner has come up with their quadrant the magic quadrant uh, i think it is just a very very simple representation of a very highly thoughtful uh, uh, symbol of swastik so when we talk about smart cities what are we going to do we need to create cities that are in balance not necessarily efficient in one aspect of life and missing out on another so we need to put together you know education is there Uh, maternal and uh, child uh, health is there um, you know infant mortality clean water uh, sanitation all, all of the things that existed a few thousand years ago now we have forgotten about them so the project uh, or the research area that i am encouraging my student friend in london to do is if we put iot devices in a city maybe a small city and we measure these the, the balance parameters we measure things that are happening dynamically happening so a bus or a vehicle is driving through a road and it is picking up carbon emission data because there is a iot device attached to the back of the bus then we are not waiting for descriptive analytics we are not waiting for uh, historical data we are actually taking decisions on the spot in yeah. terms of whether this uh, you know traffic can be rerouted whether this traffic can be stopped whether uh, more people should work from home or whether you know whatever decision we have to take same for smart city and health same for smart city and education so long as we are keeping the smart cities in balance and not going overboard it is going to be a successful uh, project or a series of projects and in terms of establishing correlations well i mean what 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 where can you establish where can you find mad like uh, correlations you know i mentioned about uh, full moon uh, punam ka chand and more accidents on the road i think smart cities should be investigating correlations that have been with us for Uh, you know a couple of thousand years and uh, 
I, I talked about, you know, turmeric. Uh, one more fascination that my friends have is I've got a picture here of uh, a wall um, somewhere in Rishikesh that was full of gober, cow dung. And it was being used to uh, have a, uh, you know, people, you know, there were small huts and they were making uh, uh, gober, uh, cow dung cakes, as I call them here. And people are fascinated and, and they are saying, what, you know, I mean, it, isn't it dirty? I said, no, no, no. A hut that is made up of a cow dung floor is actually able to prevent radioactive material or radioactivity from going through. Mm. The second important uh, uh, value of a gober, uh, gober ki leepi hui uh, jhopdi is uh, it is air conditioned. In winter, it is warm and in summer it is cold. And we don't spend money uh, trying to do that. So talk about smart cities. Are we courageous enough to say that we're going to have an office or a home that is made up of gober? <laughs> Go ahead, establish correlation, do research. And even if it doesn't happen, I think it is a worthwhile exercise. <laughs> Uh, the another question is related to the V's which are mentioned in books. The books have mentioned only four V's. Today you discussed fifth V with us. And the question is about sixth V. The participant is asking, will there be another V? The sixth V? If yes, in your view, what will it be? <laughs> well, I am, I mean, these are play of words in my opinion. And, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, the V's, we start going through the dictionary and let us see if there is a V that will fit in. And the question is important. The question is relevant. But the way I will look at the question and the way I would encourage the questioner is we are trying to investigate the characteristics of a large amount of data that is increasing in size every day. And we want to understand the characteristics so that we can make use of it in decision making. That is the underlying thinking behind the V's. So if we have, you know, a airplane, a Boeing or an Airbus that flies across the Indian Ocean or flies across the Pacific because from here to Sydney, flight over the Pacific, it generates one petabyte of data. One flight generates one petabyte. That is 1000 terabytes. And it has got all the characteristics of the Vs that we are talking about. It has got high volume. It is generated at a high velocity. It has variety. It has got graphics data. It has got height and uh, speed data. It has got phenomenal amount of data. It has got certain amount of veracity. That means it is. It has got quality. And still, and still, humanity, you and I are searching for a plane called MH370. I mean, today we cannot. Uh, we, you know. Your car, most cars, my car here cannot be stolen anymore because it has got inbuilt GPS. Uh, but an airplane is lost. So to me, the fifth V of that airplane's data is missing. There is no value. I can collect volume. I can have high velocity. I can have veracity, good quality. I can have variety. But if I cannot find a plane, in this stone age, that particular incident is firmly itched in my mind because I was in Kuala Lumpur on, uh, I think it was 6th of March, 2014. I'm forgetting exactly now. But on that day, MH370 vanished out of the sky flying towards uh, uh, China. And we had some six or eight Indians on board who were going there for the graduation. It was a disaster. But it's gone. And we do not even know where it is. And Australia was involved in the search. So coming back to your question, you are saying, which is the sixth V? I mean, you and I can sit together and we can go through the dictionary and we can find, you know, V for anything. But 
the purpose is are we going to produce some value out of it and if that value requires another characteristics whether it is a v starting with a v or starting with a a or starting with a z or a z it doesn't really matter but we are not able to make full use of even the current 4 plus 1 v that that we have so we can dig into that but there is no harm in exploring the potential of uh, another v that's my long answer to a short <laughs> question good question <laughs> so another question we have is can dark data benefits one organization um it's a philosophical question rather than a technical question because when i talked about alternative data which is let's say you know i used to work for dow jones in 1970s and uh, the the quants or the people who were quantitative analysts would uh, get up early in the mor- morning at 4 am they will go through all the newspaper reports and they will go through all the material that is available in order to come up with a sensible information on which stocks to sell and which to buy and how the market is going and so on today we have ability through machine learning to analyze 10000 reports around the world in one go now out of those 10000 we have no idea how many are useless you know and um, if you know even if 100 are useless because we are analyzing 10000 the chances of the 100 badly influencing unless they have a spike in them uh, is much less so dark data by its very definition is data we don't know exist or we cannot make any use of it so the <laughs> sorry i could not even unmute myself which is fine <laughs> so arun sir is also muted so you want to make sure that at least uh, two of us are unmuted <laughs> that's okay that's okay so if we say that by definition dark data is something hidden and something we can't make use of then what is the use what can uh, we do well if we can identify somehow that it will be a hazy identification it will not be a precise identification because precise ident- identification by definition means it is no longer dark so it's going to be a rough identification that maybe these are the kind of reports we can ignore or you know nowadays they are saying that you know Uh, corona data from china is is just unreliable or as uh, america is doing these days you know um it is stop it has stopped supporting world health organization who so uh, you know there is a very rough idea that maybe that data is meaningless or that data is misleading misleading de- data to me is also not dark enough because we can do something with it and we can be aware of it but with big data and with auto generation of data we are left with such phenomenal amount of data we don't know and i mean right now i have got four external hard disk sitting on my table and they are meant to take backups of my teaching data of my photographs of my teaching videos of the books i'm working on and i have got multiple copies of this data and i also got a online cloud back- backup that i have purchased and i don't know i mean if i die somehow to, today or tomorrow my family will not be able to benefit with any of this data and it is of value so as far as they are concerned it is it is dark so what you and i can do I mean, we put a system together we put a organization around it so that data that is potentially dark can be made visible and once it is visible then we can decide whether we want to delete it if it is of no use to us or whether we analyze it so what can we do with dark data <laughs> we can throw light on it and then we decide whether we use it <laughs> or we delete it 
So I have two more questions related to dark data on this earth. First one is, uh, what is the importance of dark data in the big data world? And another one is, is dark data reusable? No, the questions on dark data, I can understand the questions, but I still need all of us to be aware of what we mean by dark data. It is that unknown unknown. We don't even know that it exists, but it is there and it is influencing us in a dark way in the sense that if I have got 10 terabytes of data of which five terabytes are useless, let's say three terabytes more realistic is useless. But I don't know which three are useless. Therefore, I am handling the entire 10 terabytes. I am aware that roughly three terabytes are useless. This is a very simple example. I'm aware that a certain percentage, 20% is useless because my results are coming out wrong or my results, my insights don't correlate with the reality when I do testing of my algorithm. But I'm not able to figure out which 10% or which 20% is useless. That is dark data because I'm not able to get rid of it. I know it is there, but I don't know which of it is dark. So anything we want to do with dark data and we do need research in it, it has to start with where and how we are handling data generation. If we are generating data through sensors, it is like that, you know, that big uh, fireman's uh, hose uh, to drink a glass of water. If suddenly, you know, someone puts a big uh, fireman's hose uh, that is used to, you know, uh, quench uh, fires uh, in front of my mouth and all I wanted was this then I am really producing a phenomenal amount of wasted water and uh, it is going to be of no value to me. And that's what is happening with IoT sensors, uh, you know, satellite uh, generated uh, data. There are so many sources of data that are automatically generating. I mean, we talked about smart cities and smart cities, you know, we have to pay attention to make sure that we do not generate dark data. At the generation point, we have to pay phenomenal attention. Otherwise, we are going to be swamped with this data and we will not know what to do with it. So to summarize the answer, by definition, we cannot do much with dark data other than getting rid of it. We cannot figure out what to get rid of because we don't know what it is, where it exists. Only with the alternative data in that earlier slide where I said fundamental macro and alternative data, only with the alternative data, we can say that, okay, I'm not going to use any blog from China on coronavirus in my analysis, or I'm going to ignore a environmental data coming from some country X, Y, Z. Then I am able to handle data that uh, that um, will provide some value or some realistic uh, analytics. And again, of course, I don't have to own that data. In the big data world, the charm is that there are many systems, analytics, that simply lease data, borrow data for analytic purposes, but don't buy data. So in our process of reducing the data, so we are trying to reduce the big data so that we are getting rid of unwanted data. We can borrow data rather than buy and own data. And uh, weather data, for example, government sites can make uh, through APIs, uh, weather data available to us, which we don't have to download and store, which we simply analyze online and give away. Those are some strategies we can do. But other than that, by definition, you can't do much with dark data. That's why it is called dark data. So before taking some more questions, uh, I can see that we have been trying to 
by May I invite Dr. Nitin to say a few words? Dr. Nitin, are you there? Hello. I uh, can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Uh, that is again the dark side of this uh, mic. It has been muted and I'm trying to. Yes. Uh, it is a dark uh, mic. It has been muted. Uh, I must appreciate the way you have started your and ended. Both the ends are actually wonderful, and uh, thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful list of participants. Enjoyed and learned the way you have delivered today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Ankur sir, for having me. To all students, all faculty. Arun Agarwal sir, thank you for moderating. And uh, there are people asking me whether they can get slides. Yes, I will send it to Arun sir. You can share the slides. I'm very happy to share them. The recording is there as well. <clears throat> I'm very happy for it to be shared. And I look forward to more collaboration and, and to meeting with all of you in the future. Namaste. Dhanyavad. Thank you. One more, one more thing, sir. I can see that uh, we have also been joined by Dr. Parma, who is the Dean of the School of Engineering and Technology. Uh, may I invite you, sir, to say a few words to Dr. Bhuvan? Dr. Parma, are you there, sir? I think he's busy somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. He's muted, actually. He's muted. That's okay. I am glad he could uh, he could join, and uh, I can. So. We, we, oh, Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Would you like to say a few words to Dr. Bhuvan? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir, and good morning from Florida. Yeah, it was an excellent session. So I got Thank another you. meeting panel, but I okay. ensured that I listen to you also. So I was listening from both sides, and uh, the way the our. All the participants are responding and shows that uh, really you gel with all the participants. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us and hopefully we'll have a longer association with you. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Dhanyavad, sir. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Boom. Okay. So I'll take leave and yeah, all participants, we have slides and we have recording and we'll continue to interact. Arunji, बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद. We you, had uh, we had to work on really, it and <laughs> it was really a very interactive session. So I could not cover all the questions, but I can assure my participants that uh, I will uh, copy their questions the and we can post it to you so that you, whenever you get time, you can answer. Those I will reply. I will reply to all of them. Okay, sir. I'm Thank taking leave. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day.